Hi there! These next videos are going to be on some HP computers, in particular the HP 9000 series. And I have two examples of these right here. This first one up here is uh, HP 9920, also known as the 9000 220. And this one beneath it is an HP 9836, also known as the 9000 236. Um, the one down here, the 9836, includes a couple built-in floppy drives, as well as a built-in keyboard. This one up here has absolutely no storage, and its keyboard plugs in via this weird um, modular jack. So the, the nice thing about these computers is just how expandable they are. So you can see this one has a lot of slots in the back of it with a bunch of cards plugged into the slots. There's actually 16 slots in this 9920. Um, each one of these uh, panels removes, there's two boards can go in it, um, as well as a slot down here for the CPU board. Uh, so you can see it's got some HPIB devices, it's got a color video, it's got a monochrome video, um, audio keyboard, just all kinds of stuff in here. So you can still find these relatively plentiful on eBay and generally HP built these very well and they all still seem to just work right out of the box and you can find cards for them and when you get one of them sometimes you'll find some interesting mystery cards like this one has a floating point card in it that must have been useful to someone at some point. Choosing between the two of them I can say that this 9836 down here although it does have the two built-in floppies and the keyboard it is just an absolute huge beast of a computer. It is heavy um, it has like a gigantic transformer inside of it. I really do need to do some teardown videos on these because they're, they're kind of interesting. But this one's kind of a beast. I kind of like working on this one a little bit better. In this video, what I'm going to do is to build a RAM card for this. This is actually a RAM and Flash card, so it's going to have the basic language programmed into Flash, as well as three megabytes of RAM. And then you would plug it right into one of the slots, like so. So I wanted to send out a thank you to Dominique Berger who helped me get started with this project. Uh, Dominique makes uh, and sells memory boards for these, so he um, had a schematic of the original HP uh, 4.0 basic board, as well as his replacement uh, basic 4.0 board. And that was really my starting point uh, to build my own flash board and then uh, it was easy to figure out from there how to add the, uh, the RAM capability as well. Uh, so thank you, Dominique, for your help in uh, getting started with this project. Okay, let's start going through the schematic. I've got to warn you that it is kind of a long, complicated schematic. It's going to take about 15 minutes to get through it all. And then after that, I'll show one of the completed boards, and then we'll do some demos on uh, both of these computers. Okay, here is the schematic for the HP Flash and RAM board that I built. Uh, the schematic's about five pages long, so I'm going to take it page by page. The first page has most of the important stuff on it. So in here is the HP DIO bus connector. This is the big um, edge card connector where the uh, RAM board plugs into the computer. You can see here it's got about 16 data lines. This is because this is a 16-bit computer. And it's got 23 address lines. Now an interesting thing here is the first address line is A1. It's not A0. And again, that is because it's a 16-bit computer. It transfers data 16 bits at a time. To figure out which half of the 16 bits um, you're transferring, there's these... Uh, BLDS and BUDS, that's um, lower data select and upper data select, I believe. Those two lines, um, when BLDS is selected, you're transferring the lower eight bits. And when BUDS is selected, you're transferring the upper eight bits. And of course, it can do both at the same time. So over here on the data side, we take all of these data lines and we put them through a couple of 75 ALS 245 buffers. So these two buffers have their own individual select lines to turn them on and off. So there's a U-buff line that I put into this one and an L-buff line into this one. And that's because the computer can decide to transfer either half of the data independently. You could just do a lower transfer, or you could just do an upper, or you could do them both. And then there is a direction bit, which I got this from a read signal. 
Other things on here, you'll see there's a couple of fuses. These are actually uh, two different footprints superimposed on one another. We do want a fuse on the power coming from the computer. Um, other data lines we've got from the computer include this read-write. So it's a high if it's a read, low if it's a write. And address select. Um, AS is what it puts out when it has put an address on the bus. So we can see a bunch of address pins come out here. We take most of them and we buffer them through 74 ALS 244 buffers. So that gives us the first um, 16, about 19 address lines we'll put through those buffers. And there is no need to control the direction of that and there's no need to enable or disable that buffering. So it's simply on all the time. The next thing we have to discuss is how we decode our signals and figure out which chips to activate and which buffers to activate. And what I did is what I've done in several of my other designs, which is to use a programmable logic device. Usually I would use an ATF16V8, but the ATF16V8 didn't have enough pins um, on it, so I went with an ATF22V10. And that is this programmable logic device here. It's got, oh, about 12 inputs and about another 10 outputs. That's how you get the 22. Uh, so you can see here on the inputs, we've got the read-write goes in, the five uppermost uh, address bits, we've got the address select, the upper and lower data selects, three lines which I ran over to a dip switch so that you can turn various features on and off. That goes in and then on the other side comes out a select bit for selecting the flash, uh, selects for each of three RAM chips, a read signal and two write signals, one for whether we're writing the upper part and one for whether we're writing the lower part. We don't really have to differentiate between reading the upper and lower, we'll just catch that at the buffer. Um, a board select, which we will turn on whenever any device is enabled, um, and then lower buffer and upper buffer, which control those two latches. So now let's talk about these remaining lines that we have going through uh, these registers. So the board CS goes up here and goes through this buffer. Um, it's just straight up buffering that. That's going to add a little bit of delay to that line. And then it comes out and we'll call it card select. Uh, now that comes out here and goes into another buffer. And it's actually turning this buffer on and off. So when the board is selected, uh, it drives board CS down, drives card select down, enables this um, 74 ALS 244 half here. And the first thing that does is it passes a ground through the, this IMA line on the bus. Now IMA stands for I'm addressed. And this is the board telling the computer that it is taking on this address and it will be doing the work. So this is a tri-state line. When the board is not selected, this line just floats and other boards can issue their IMA lines. Uh, but as soon as we're selected, we pull that IMA down, which says that we are handling this bus transaction. So now the complicated bit in this whole thing is this DTAC line. So the way this works is your board, it first drops the IMA to say you're addressed. Then you do your data transfer, uh, you know, either you read or write to memory, and then you pull down DTAC to tell the computer that you're done. And that allows you to use boards of differing speeds. So back in the day, there might have been diff significantly different RAM speeds. So a board might take longer than another, or a ROM might take a different amount of time, etc. cetera. Uh, so the board could actually control that particular timing by issuing this DTAC when it was done. Uh, now, there were several ways to do that. The first was something called auto DTAC. And auto DTAC, as far as I can tell, it was only implemented on the 200 series computers. It doesn't seem to be implemented on the 300. And what it would do was for certain addresses, spaces, um, the non-RAM addresses, so things that were in the internal I.O. space as well as ROM boards, it would generate the DTAC for you. Uh, I don't know if they just chose what they thought was a typical delay and implemented it. Uh, but it generates the DTAC. You can actually, in that case, you could leave this jumper off and the board would actually, it would work because the computer's generating the AX itself. For the 300 series computers, I haven't found where it does auto DTAC at all. Um, I tried leaving the jumper off, board didn't work. How do you go about implementing the DTAC? Well, there's two different ways to do it. 
One is the computer will issue this end T. I think that stands for enable DTAC. It issues that signal like one and a half clock cycles after the IMA, something like that. Um, you can pass that through as DTAC and that will acknowledge your transfer. However, the computer doesn't always do that, which is kind of annoying. It will do that for normal transfers, but if you install a 98620 DMA board, the DMA board doesn't implement the NT. In that case, what you have to do is you have to implement a delay yourself. So you need to delay, I don't know, like around 60, 70 nanoseconds or so, and then pull this DTAC low F, F from your IMA to your DTAC. So what I did is I put a jumper on here. So just sort of maximum flexibility. You could jumper it in one spot and use the uh, ENDT line. You could jumper it in another spot and use a fixed delay. Or you could jumper it up here where I'm going to implement some more complicated logic inside of a PL inside of another PLD. So let's go over to that schematic. So I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail on this. This is where we handle the DTAC logic. And I could have done this probably with a couple of 74 series gates, but I threw in a PLD, a slightly smaller one, a 16V8, uh, just because um, it's expensive getting boards made. And if I need to do any revisions, you can do them in the PLD rather than you know, having to make a new board. So a bunch of input comes to this board. The card select from the first page is some address bits, um, a delay line, the ENDT from the bus, a couple dip, dip switches for uh, options, and out comes a DTAC, uh, which we can use to drive the bus. And now the 16V8 can be operated in a tri-state mode with its output, so it can either let this float or drive it high or drive it low. So that's perfect and will fit the bus specifications. Um, so what it really implements is a fancy uh, sort of an OR gate where it can say, you know, drive the DTAC if we get an end ENDT or if the, the delay occurs. So, you know, drive it on the ENDT signal or drive it, you know, 60 nanoseconds after the board was selected. And then I wanted to offer some flexibility um, so that you could um, add additional delay. So I went up here and I used a 74 LS14 uh, Schmidt trigger hex inverter. Now this has a fairly deterministic uh, 15 nanoseconds or so per gate. So you grab two gates worth of it and you'll get an additional 30 nanoseconds of delay. Grab four gates worth of it, you'll get 60. Grab all six gates and you ought to get 90 nanoseconds. Um, they do also make dedicated uh, delay line chips. So down here is a footprint for a Dallas DS1000 chip, which would have been perfect, uh, but these are no longer made. I put in the footprint anyway. So there is a jumper block where you can select um, the delay that you want, including a position here, which is for zero. Uh, now you would think selecting zero would not be right, uh, that you do need to give the memory some time to do its work. But there's really quite a few gates that the signals already have to go through by the time they get back to the uh, CPU. And I measured it uh, for it to drive everything through the buffers on the first page, through the PLDs, all the way out to that DTAC signal with the jumper in the zero position. I measured that out to be about 62 nanoseconds with my oscilloscope. So you can just put your jumper in here and don't even have to populate the 74LS14, and of course don't have to populate the DS1000M. Now, if for any reason that turned out to be not enough delay, then I would suggest add in the 74LS14 and stick the jumper down here in the Dell 1 position. Um, and that should do. In no case would you populate this uh, DS1000 uh, down here. Anyhow, I will put up a lot more details about this on the blog post when I do the write-up. It'll probably make a lot more sense in written form than me trying to uh, explain how all of this DTACing logic works here. So let's go through the remaining pages. They're, they're all a bit simpler. Down here, we have the first two sockets on the board. These are where you would put in the flash chips for your, um, your basic ROM. So because this is a 16-bit computer, you have both high and low bytes. So one ROM has the lows, the other one has the highs, um, and there's a separate write strobe uh, for uh, low and high. Why would you want to write it? Well, I think you should be able to do uh, in-circuit 
upgrade. Um, you should be able to reflash it from a basic program, perhaps. I have never tried that, but it is hooked up so you could write the flash if you wanted to. Um, you'll notice some jumpers out here. You wonder what those are about. And that is the, the pinout for an AS60 uh, 4008 static RAM is almost the same as the pinout for a 39 SF040 flash chip except these few lines. So I designed the board so that you could um, put RAM chips here instead and make yourself a straight RAM board instead of a combo RAM and flash board. Anyhow, you put all of the jumpers in the one, two position uh, to use flash, or you would put all of the jumpers in the two, three position uh, to use RAM. And then we have the next page, which has six sockets for RAM chips. These are all AS60 4008 chips all wired up in the obvious way um, you can see they go low byte high byte low byte high byte and there is a separate right strobe for the lows and the highs and then finally page four this was just for fun i threw in some status lights so i drive the status lights with another 74 ls 244 buffer i've actually taken the the wire out of that um, so that you can enable or disable the buffer and turn the lights on and off but each one of the uh, chip selects, so chip select for the flash or for RAMs 1, 2, or 3, goes to a separate light. The read and write strobes go out to, to lights, and the board chip select goes out to a light. And then, of course, there's a current limiting resistor here for the LEDs, and that gives you a nice little status light effect. You can look at the back of your board and see which RAM it's accessing or, you know, whether it's accessing the flash. It was a great way to diagnose the circuit. Okay, here is the completed board. I have basic 5.1 flashes here and here, the 39SF040. And then I have a total of six AS6C4008 static RAMs here, 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 and here. Here we have the programmable logic device. It's set up for the flash board. That's why I have a sticker on it. Uh, here we have the other PLD that handles the DTAC timing. We have the 74LS14. I have this jumper set at the 90 nanosecond delay approximate. I could probably move it all the way over there and it'd work fine. I think this was one that I was using while I was doing some testing. And then down here we have the um, two data line buffers for upper and lower. And we have the three buffers that are used for the address lines. Up here we have a bunch of LEDs for the blinky lights, a buffer that drives the LEDs, the dip switches. I like to use these uh, right angle ones so you can easily access the switches from the side. Uh, the jumpers are set here for, uh, for flashes, which are the pins one and two on each of those jumpers. And I think that's about everything. There is a, there is a fuse here. Uh, there's room for a beefy capacitor. I haven't put that in yet. And then here are the dip switches. So the first dip switch enables the ROM feature. You, if you were to flip it down, it would disable the ROMs. The next one flips the addressing between the address for BASIC 4.0 and BASIC 5.1. Um, if you've installed the 4.0 BASIC, you would flip that switch down. The next one turns the RAM feature on and off, so flip it down and the RAM would be disabled. This one enables the blinky lights, so right now it is in the down position, so the blinky lights are enabled. Um, this one here controls the function of DTAC in the range that auto DTAC is sometimes present. Um, so on a 200 series computer, probably leave it up. On a 300 series, probably flip it down. And the last one enables the delay feature uh, with the DTAC. So leave it up and it should work with your DMA board. Flip it down and it probably won't work with the DMA board. And here is the second board. This one here is configured as only RAM. There are no flash devices, so this is four megabytes of RAM. It's eight um, AS6C4008 chips. Um, everything else is pretty much the same. The PLD does get different programming for that configuration. Here I did have the uh, delay jumper placed in the first position, and you don't even need to populate the 74LS14. Um, I use different size LEDs up there. The first dip switch configures the amount of RAM. If it's in the up position, then it's um, four megabytes. If you flipped it down, it would be a three megabyte board. The second one configures the position of the RAM. If it was all the way up, 
um, then the RAM would be at the top of memory, so it would be a first board configuration. Move it down, and it will put the RAM three megabytes down in the um, addressing, which is where you would put it to follow the, um, the, the flash and ROM board with an additional four megabytes of memory. Uh, the third switch is to enable the RAM. If you flipped it down, it would disable the RAM entirely. For fourth switch is for blinking lights. Uh, fifth switch is just like the flashboard. This is for the auto DT -ACK. Um And then the sixth switch is the delay feature. I will uh, put a chart up describing all of the dip switch settings on the blog. Okay, let's try a quick demo. Here is an HP 9920U. I've taken all of the RAM boards out of it. The 9920U is the upgraded version of the 9920. Uh, it does not have the 68010, but it does have a 68000 with a, a cache installed on it instead of RAM. So this computer will have no RAM in it at all when we boot it up. And it should complain. Yep, so RAM gone. That is the standard error you get when there are no RAM boards. And we're going to install my board here. This is the basic 5.1 and 3 megabytes. Plug it in and turn it on. So you can see my blinky lights are working. The computer's up because it does have RAM this time. And it's doing its self-test. So it's going to test the memory and you'll actually see the chip selects light up as each memory chip is checked. And it did display on there three megabytes, so it did have the right amount of memory. Flash by kind of quick. It booted the uh, basic 5.1 uh, ROM. And here we are in basic. Available memory about three megabytes. Working as expected. Actually, a four megabyte RAM board. I will add it in. And turn it on. It has different size LEDs, so they're not as bright. But here we go, booting up. And it's going to go into its memory test testing memory and now you'll see the LEDs uh, light up on each of the boards as it tests each bank of memory so it's testing the second board first and then now it's going down and it's testing the first board and it should flash up and say we have seven megabytes of RAM booting a system there we go over here I have an HP drive that is an emulated disk let's hook it up I have the high-speed disk interface and behind the high-speed disk interface is a 9920 um, whoops, some buttons there. Behind the high-speed disk interface is a 9920 DMA board. So let's see if we can boot from the HP drive and make sure uh, that this whole thing works with uh, the DMA from the high-speed disk interface. Okay, the HP drive is up and running, so I'm going to reboot this. And the image that I'm serving is a basic 6.3 image off of this HP drive. And we'll see if it picks that up. So there is our 996 or so there is our 98620 um, DMA board. Still doing its memory test. And there we go, it is booting SysB62, that is the basic 6.2 image, off that HP drive. And it's up and running, basic 6.21. 
Okay, the HP 9836 is a little bit different than the others in that it's got a digital video output here with uh, horizontal and vertical sync and uh, intensity and, and picture bits in it. We'll have to hook that up to an MCE to VGA to get it to work. Got your usual HP IB and then you've got four slots over here. Let's see what's inside of here, shall we? My guess is we will find a bunch of RAM boards. That's what you find in almost every one of these is a pile of RAM boards. That's it. It doesn't look like there is anything down there. Yep, so that's it. So the last uh, few slots are unpopulated. So let's, um, let's go ahead and pull these out. I will take my basic 5.1 and install it. It can go in any slot, it doesn't matter. Now we're going to flip him around. Urgh, he is heavy. and we'll uh, do a quick demo. Hooked up to it, I have my MCE to VGA that I typically use for these kind of projects. It's hooked up there. I did some custom hacking to kind of mostly sort of get it to work with the HP uh, video. Wired in the back with a custom adapter cable hooked up to my VGA monitor. Okay, I've got the camera pointed at the monitor. Let's turn it on and see what happens. The first thing you'll notice is it's kind of black on green. That's because I haven't finished uh, hacking the MCE to VGA and I, I still need to invert uh, the video bit. So right now it's kind of displaying all inverted. But we had uh, 3.2 megabytes was displayed there. That is because the CPU card itself had uh, 256K on it. So even with all the RAM boards out of it, this computer still has 256K plus the uh, three megabytes from the basic board. Um, so it should all be working here. Whoops. I'm uh, typing left-handed so it's a little bit slow. There we go. Okay, just for completeness sake, I also have my HP 310 here. 310 is a little bit newer than the 200 series machines we've been looking at so far. It has a Motorola 68010, a little bit newer processor. Um, it does have a megabyte uh, down here on the processor board, but it's supposed to auto-locate that megabyte. And uh, if there's no room for it, I'm assuming it won't use it. It'll use what's in the card. So I do have, so I do have the basic board with three megabytes, and then also the four megabyte board. So we should fill all of the memory with the the two cards. So let's boot it up and see what happens. Once again, we're testing memory, and you'll be able to see all of the LEDs light down there. And it has booted Basic 5.1 from the ROM. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.